testing is not really a diagnostic dilemma, uh, but the idea that when we see patients that we should be testing them, especially in this era where we are talking about ending the HIV epidemic, but also knowing that um, Wayne County is one of the hot spots and not doing too great in ending this epidemic. So we um, have this one case of a 58 year old male. Initially, he was referred from some clinic, he was referred to hematology for pancytopenia. So uh, in October, he was seen in hematology for pancytopenia monoclonal gammopathy. They saw him, they, you know, they did some workup, uh, but soon after that, he got admitted to the hospital because of shortness of breath, diffuse lymphadenopathy, and hyperpigmented lesions on his leg. Um, in the hospital, he was stabilized. He was found to be anemic. They thought that was the reason for his shortness of breath. He got a couple of units of blood. He was discharged, um, and with a follow-up with hematology for possible bone biopsy, and also a follow-up with dermatology for biopsy of these hyperpigmented lesions on his legs. Um, so that was in November <coughs> of last year. He then gets seen by hematology again in February of this year. He has worsening pancyte. They see him. He has worsening pancytopenia. They, they postulate that it's possibly secondary to folate deficiency. They also know that he has elevated LFTs, and his LFTs weren't really that elevated, but they were slightly elevated. So for that day, he gets referred to hepatology. In March, he gets seen by hepatology uh, for these elevated L LFTs. As part of that workup, they do an extensive workup for um, elevated liver function tests. Uh, that's what LFTs are, liver function tests. Um, he, they, you know, he gets a hepatitis serology is done. Um, he gets a rheumatological workup done. So extensive workup, which for our discussion right now wasn't that relevant. So I didn't put all that in. But they also, the hepatologist decides that with all this going on, she should do a fourth generation HIV test. So this is the first time he ever gets a test done. Um, and he has been seen in the healthcare system since uh, October of 2018. These were his labs over those few months. Just I'm just talking about his WBCs and his hemoglobin platelets. If you look at it over a, um, those that time, his uh, white cell count does drop. It goes from 6.5 to 4.1. What really drops is his hemoglobin from 13.4 to 8.6, and his platelets that decrease slowly from 158 to 100. His HIV test that was ordered by the hemato by the hepatologist is positive, it's reactive, and his HIV-1 is reactive too. So the reason for his pancytopenia was really his um, that he was HIV infected. But what were these hyperpigmented lesions that um, the patient kept talking about? Um, I'll show th those to you in a minute. I thought that was the next slide, but I, I have a slide. So he is seen in the ID clinic within a week of his diagnosis. When he's seen in the clinic, he's complaining of hyperpigmented lesions on his skin. He's short of breath, he's complaining of dizziness. In the clinic, his blood pressure is 93 over 58, his pulse is 104. He just does not look good. So the decision was made to admit him to the hospital. In the hospital, oh, so these were his, sorry, I'm a little confused about these slides. So in the clinic, some of these pictures are from the clinic, some are um, when they were taken in the hospital. So this picture here, if you can see the arrow, this lesion he had had for a while, this was on his uh, leg, it was hyperpigmented, it was raised, it was 
by lesions. So there was this one lesion. There were multiple lesions on his feet. There were all these hyperpigmented lesions on his scalp. And if you looked at his back, you know, I could have put about 20 pictures and they all looked the same. They had these lesions all over his body. So in the hospital, uh, when he was admitted, he was found to be in acute, uh, he had acute kidney injury. His creatinine was 8.7. His shortness of breath was most likely secondary to anemia. His hemoglobin was 6.2. On day three of the hospital, uh, hospital admission, he developed a massive GI bleed, was transferred to the ICU. He had EGD done. Multiple gastric ulcers were seen with a flat pigmented spot. And the histopath of these lesions was consistent with Kaposi sarcoma. So the patient basically had disseminated Kaposi sarcoma with involvement of the GI tract. And he had biopsy of his skin lesions done. All those hyperpigmented lesions that he had been complaining about, those were all Kaposi sarcoma. So while in the hospital, he was stabilized, he was started on antiretrovirals, which was TAP and tricytabine, prezista, and cobacistat. Um, he had about a two week stay in the hospital and he was discharged home. Labs on discharge looked pretty good uh, compared to when he came in. His uh, white cell count was 3.8, hemoglobin 9.5. Um, not where we wanted, but much better, and it was stable at that. Um, his platelets were 200, and his creatinine was 1.22. Um, since then, he has been seen in our clinic, I think, twice, and um, he's doing well, uh, taking his antiretrovirals, and his numbers are looking much better. So I actually um, uh, showed you this case to make this point of um, how we are no longer testing our patients. And if we don't test our patients, um, what happens to them? That they do poorly, the patients do poorly, um, and also the risk of transmission because we know that most of this transmission occurs uh, when patients don't know their status. And towards the um, latter half of my talk, I'll talk about that. But I did want to show you a couple of slides on KS, on Kaposi sarcoma. So the AIDS-associated Kaposi sarcoma is what's known as epidemic Ka uh, Kaposi sarcoma. Um, it was, AIDS was described in 1981. And I didn't realize that Kaposi sarcoma at that time was seen in 30 to 40% of the patients. It does seem high, but that was the number that's been quoted. So um, it is predominantly seen in men who have sex with men, rare in intravenous drug users and in women. It usually starts as a small, non-itchy, slightly painful, violaceous patch, first around the head and neck, trunk, limbs, and oral mucosa, and then it progresses. Visceral lesions are frequent. GI and pulmonary involvement are common. Um, it advances very rapidly, but is not always fatal. So our patient could have died from his massive GI bleed, but he did okay. So what is it that, uh, what is the virus that is implicated for um, KS? It's HHV8, but we don't know what is the mechanism linking infection uh, of this virus to the vascular lesions are unknown. That mechanism is unknown. Um, how do you diagnose KS? Most of us, when we saw him in the clinic, we thought we knew this was KS. I don't think we had any doubts that the lesions on the various parts of his body were anything else but KS. But still, even when you are quite sure, you will still need to get a tissue biopsy um, for diagnosis. Then if you think other parts for staging, you need chest radiographies or a chest x-ray. And then if it's indicated, um, an endoscopy, abdominal ultrasound, or CT scan to see if there is involvement of other viscera. So there, this 
we don't even need to go over this. There's no really officially accepted system for staging Kaposi's sarcoma. Remember, there are all different types of Kaposi's sarcoma. Um, so there really isn't any one uh, system of staging it. There is one classification system. But even based on this, it doesn't tell you who should be treated and who shouldn't be treated. In the HIV infected patients, ART or antiretroviral therapy is the key to effective treatment of Kaposi sarcoma. That's what these patients need. Even if they have visceral disease, um, everybody needs antiretrovirals. There are some other treatments um, KS eventually can be fatal, especially if it involves the visceral organs and it's not treated. Um, peripherally, there's a number of ways of treating it, surgical excision, cryotherapy, electrodesiccation. Chemotherapy is indicated when there's involvement of viscera um, and then radiation. And there have been some studies done with interferon, but we don't use that. Um, now we use mostly chemotherapy and interferon was mostly used for injection of the lesions, right? It wasn't yeah, really used as a systemic they, agent. They used, I think, in blasting of increasing interlesional injection. Also, yeah. right? Yeah. And then reasons to consider chemotherapy. So interestingly, symptomatic foot involvement, which I guess can be very painful, uh, is a reason to consider chemotherapy, pulmonary involvement, and gastrointestinal involvement is not always a, a reason, um, but um, if they have extensive involvement, some people will treat uh, with chemotherapy, and then if they have extensive lymph edema, um, is the reason to use chemotherapy. And so, like I was talking about, um, why is it essential that it's not a matter of whether they have Kaposi sarcoma or other opportunistic diseases or none. We actually want to diagnose these patients before they get advanced HIV. Because even from the US statistics, we can see that new HIV diagnosis have declined substantially, but the progress is stalling. So we continue to see about 40 to 45,000 new cases each year. And um, that number should, is really not going down. Um, and there's a concern that there's a real risk of HIV exploding again in the US. And that's due to several factors. One is of course due to um, intravenous drug use, which seems you know, at least for us who live in Detroit, pretty rampant, and in other parts of the country too. Um, and then healthcare providers are just not testing patients, just like we saw in this case. They do extensive workup, um, but they don't test patients. And as we know from the CDC guidelines that everybody between the ages of 13 and 65 should have at least one test done. Um, once in their lifetime. Um, in addition to the fact that, um, you know, we continue to uh, see new cases, there are certain areas which have the highest burden of HIV diagnosis. So there are 48 highest burden counties and Wayne County is actually in one of those highest burden counties. Um, if you look at Washington, D.C., San Juan, and Puerto Rico accounted for more than 50% of the new HIV diagnosis during 2016 and 17. And, you know, there are little dots on the map. Seven states with substantial rural burdens of HIV are indicated by the shaded area. So these states, we actually, this is just a map because I can't ever remember which is which state. My geography is pretty bad. So these states are Missouri here, Oklahoma, Arkansas, Mississippi, Alabama, um, this is South Carolina, and this is Kentucky. These are the states with 
um, substantial rural burden of HIV. So, um, you know, they're adding a lot to this epidemic right now. And then, of course, we, where is Wayne County, is this little blue dot here. Here? There you go. <laughs> this yeah, yeah, here, 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 sorry. I always get these blue yeah, dots Chicago mixed. mixed up. Here, this is the blue dot. That's our um, Wayne County. So uh, there's the 2020 National HIV AIDS Strategy Indicators. And how are we going to, what is the assessment of Michigan's progress? Um, so the indicators now measure improvements between baseline 2010 and 2020. There are three main uh, goals uh, which have remained the same. Reduce new HIV infection, increase access to care and improve health outcome for people living with HIV. And that's really important in, in terms of improving health uh, access to care because we really have to improve access to care where these patients live. So improving access to care for a patient who lives in Alpena and saying, oh, they could come down to Henry Ford is not going to help that patient. So we really have to improve the access to care where the patients live um, or somewhere close to that. And of course, reduce HIV uh, related health disparities. So if you look at Michigan uh, care continuum, um, doesn't it looks like you're not doing the greatest, not the worst, but not the greatest. So we have about um, 17,000 who are HIV infected, but only about 15,000 that are diagnosed, out of which 12,000 are in care and 10,000 are virally suppressed. But of those that are virally suppressed, there are only about 7,000 that maintain undetectable viral load. And I guess that's going to be a number that's going to be very important going forward. So it's not that we want them to be virally suppressed just once, but that they continue to remain virally suppressed, which is going to be important to, uh, to prevent transmission of infection as well as for the health of the patient. So we really need Michigan programs need to focus on linking and retain, retaining patients in care. And this will improve maintenance of low viral load levels, improving the health of the patients and then reducing the risk of transmission. And if we do all that, maybe we can be part of this plan of ending the HIV epidemic. Because according to that plan, that's right now is the correct time. So we have the right data, we have the right tools, right leadership, um, and that there is no reason why this HIV should explode all over again. So what do we have to look at? We have to look at epidemiology. So most new HIV infections are clustered in limited numbers of counties and specific demographics. We have highly effective antiretroviral therapy, uh, which is increasingly simple and safe. There is pre-exposure prophylaxis available for patients who are not HIV infected, but high risk for acquiring infection. There is a 25 year experience engaging and retaining patients in effective care. And there's extensive surveillance infrastructure in place for rapid detection and response capacity is increasing. So we really can do it now, but we have to make sure we diagnose our patients. So this is what we have to, these are the goals that we have to achieve. Diagnose, diagnose everybody. Don't let them go through your healthcare system for all sorts of uh, reasons and not get an HIV test. Um, treat these infections rapidly and effectively. Protect people at highest risk of HIV with potent evidence-based interventions and then respond effectively to clusters. So let's, you know, the resources should be where these clusters and outbreaks of new HIV 
infections are. And if we do all that, maybe we can reach these UN AIDS targets and maybe better by 2030, where 95% um, of the patients should be diagnosed, 95% should be on treatment, and 95% should be virally suppressed. Um, and these are worldwide numbers. So this is not 200,000 less, 200,000 new infections in the United States. This is for the world. But these are UN AIDS targets and then zero discrimination. We need zero discrimination even here still. And that really is my last slide. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mark. Questions? Was on the phone so that we can talk a little and I have to unmute people. This was 20 minutes. Okay, the audience is unmuted. Um, so, some of you are health department folks and some of you are individual providers. Um, firstly, I guess one of my questions is, have you noticed if you're in a health system that people are coming to care late or that, that there's missed opportunity for testing? Has anyone had a personal kind of experience with that they want to share? Chelsea, are you there? Yep, I'm here. Can you hear me? Yep, I can hear you. I just want to make sure people can hear. <laughs> yep, yep, we're absolutely good. Okay, good. So nobody's had this experience where you've seen someone come to care a little bit late, later than you had thought, or maybe you've seen them kind of floating around for a while and in your health system, and then all of a sudden they turn up positive. Um, that's not something you've seen in any of your experiences. Does anybody have questions about the case itself, about Kaposi or about that particular individual, um, why we think that things happen the way they did? I can make a statement on people if I can. Yeah, yes, yeah. you can. So just, you know, always. In, uh, uh, so a little amazed. So if you do 90, 90, 90, and I'm just doing it on my phone, yeah. that still leaves 27% of people unsuppressed. 95, 95, 95 leaves about 16% of people, 14% uh, uh, of people unsuppressed. So it still leaves a lot of people, even those goals are, you know, maybe for us uh, lofty goals, they're not so lofty when you think that there still be lots of people with those goals who are not virally suppressed. Mm -hmm. So um, so I think we actually need to even try to do better if we can. It's very difficult to do 85, 85, 85. Well, so, yeah. <laughs> so I mean, we still have a, a lot of uh, work to do. And then just one comment. You know, I think in the early days of HIV, the initial reports were pneumocystis and Kaposi sarcoma. So, That's how uh, cases were often recognized. Mm -hmm. I don't recall that we ever saw Kaposi in 40% of our patients, though, was very common. Okay. Yeah. I was surprised with that number, 40%. Yeah. So I'm not sure, but I think people have forgotten what it looks like because yeah. uh, we don't see it like, you know, 15 years ago. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think most of us would uh, recognize it on, just by looking. And uh, now I was walking around through multiple clinics, seeing multiple physicians, residents, staff. And no and one's nobody, recognizing nobody it. Nobody recognizing it or even sending them to dermatology for a biopsy. I think that patient actually did get sent to dermatology. Did he? <laughs> so uh, interestingly, the same patient was seen in dermatology. So this in 2015. And there are no pictures from 2015, but when you read the description of his hyperpigmented lesions in 2015, they sound like, and where they were, so they were on his scalp, they were on his back, there was one on his leg, they are in the same re region, region that, they that are he, they are now, 
that he actually was probably infected in 2015 too, mm -hmm. and that he had Kaposi sarcoma, and he had actually self-referred himself to dermatology for these mm -hmm. lesions. And he was, because he's a African-American man, he was being treated for just hyperpigmentation of his skin with all sorts of creams and lotions. Mm -hmm. And I've seen that actually a couple times in African-American men. Yeah. I think that the other thing to to sort of note, um, and I understand that a lot of you are not HIV clinicians, but you work with people um, sort of through different uh, ways, through the health departments, through um, various health systems, is that that Kaposi can, can progress quite quickly. Um, and in some of my patients have gone from having a single or two or three little spots to having big plaques on their skin within a very short period of time. Um, and, and a lot of times that's what will alarm them and bring them into a doctor um, is they'll be like, oh my goodness, all of a sudden I got this rash. Um, and, and they can't quite figure out why they got it so quickly. Um, and, and then hopefully an astute provider will test them. Um, also, I think that the other thing is that since all of us work in different areas, the one thing that Dr. Barr was really trying to point out is it's sort of all of our responsibility to to inform the other providers and other people that we work with to remind them to test people and to sort of bring that awareness to them that hey, you know, this is this is something we need to be doing. Um, we here are talking about trying to get an alert in our Epic system to sort of bring up a little box that says, hey, has this person ever had an HIV test or is this person high risk or you know, something to that effect. Do you, any of you have something like that in your health system? Like Bronson, I see some some people from Bronson are on the line. Um, and do you guys have anything like that at Bronson? I can't remember who's on from Bronson. Let me see who's there. Oh. So Jennifer sent in a question, um, and she's wondering when oral lesions manifest, um, if that's a late sign or is it in highly individualized? Like, can, can you stage oral it? Kaposi sarcoma? Mm -hmm. So the, I don't think it is a late oh. sign. They uh, occur any time during the disease process. I don't think our guy had oral lesions, he but did, he I did. I, did I didn't see any. I don't I remember, but we've had other patients with oral lesions. Mm -hmm. our, our patient actually had a lesion even in his eye. Yes, he did. In his conjunctiva. And I have seen young people with lesions in their mouth yeah. um, before. So Jennifer, I guess there's no hard and fast answer. It's not necessarily a late or early sign. It's individualized. Um, so that I hope that answers your question. Does anyone else have a question they'd like to ask? And it can be about anything, even if it's not something we talked about today. Um, sometimes I know that people have questions about new treatments or new things coming out, um, and this would be a good time to, you know, a good place to ask those kinds of questions too. If you just have some burning curiosity. Does it tell me who? Okay, if there's not any more questions today, we can end. Um, hmm? Well, we've already lost several people, so I don't I did want to know, there's someone on a cell phone that's named as wireless caller. Can you tell me who you are? Can you unmute your phone? Oh, but we don't know who they are. No, it says their phone number. If there are also suggested topics, I think I feel like they're talking and we can't hear them. Yeah. Jennifer, I can see you on there. Can you can you talk? Like, if you unmute your phone, can you talk so I can hear you? We're we're trying to determine if we can hear people talking. People. 
think she talked a little bit here. And then her eyes are shooting. Can now I can hear you. Are you there? Okay. Can you hear me better now? Yeah, I can hear you now. Okay. <laughs> can can, can you, you hear me better me now? Better now. <laughs> can, you, can you hear me? <laughs> we yeah, lost, yeah, the, sorry, we sorry. lost our audio for a second. I don't think we could we couldn't hear you guys. Um, so we asked, were there more questions? That was the one thing. Um, and then the other question was, we had several people on, on cell phones and we couldn't tell who they were. Yes, I'm, yes, one, I'm of one of them, Jennifer. Jennifer. Okay. Uh, and then there's, a, is there another, which Jennifer are you? Kern. Kern. Okay, so you're showing up twice. Your name shows up and as a wireless. Um, and then is there anyone else that's on a phone? Nope. Okay. All right. Hello. So, hello. This is Chris Ann Craven. I'm at Bronson. Okay, Chris Ann. One of the questions we had for Bronson is do you guys have any kind of an alert in Epic that shows to test people for HIV, like a pop up, like a like you know, like an immunization reminder would be or a um, a health screening reminder? Does that come is that something you guys have there? Yeah, we can put it in each um, chart, and then we can also add a sticky note so that when you log in, it pops up um, with more information. So it's telling you that they're positive, but there's anything there to remind you to test the person or not? Like sort of. Yeah, you can add. Yeah, you can add that into um, each individual record in their health maintenance to add certain oh, okay. testing. So, like, if you considered someone to be high risk, maybe you would add that as uh, a, something that would remind people to do a test on them. But yeah, I would put it under their health maintenance. Um, up, like, for a yearly update, it will it'll pop up. Okay. Oh, okay. But it's not universal on everybody with AG 13 to 64. No, 64. it's not universal. Oh, okay. Okay. All right. Well, that's interesting. We were just trying to see, you know, we're thinking about trying to get something like that here. So we wanted to know. Um, and what about any of the county people? Do you know, is that anything you guys would have in, in do any of you even have EMR at your counties or not? Is it all paper still? He comes on, I'm wondering, is there a bigger house for that? Okay. Well, thank you for coming on to the call today. We appreciate it. If you have any topics that you want to hear about, give me an email or call or whatever, and we'll um, we'll try to bring those up um, in future conferences. And have a great day, everyone. The sun is shining here in Detroit. Hopefully, it is where you're at. <laughs> just went away. <laughs> thank you. All right. Have a great day. Bye bye. Okay.